for you newbies. <laughs> so, good morning, Chris Ole, Wake Forest Baptist Health, infectious diseases. So, uh, how far is how many days until Christmas now? Um, Fifteen. 15. <laughs> uh, yeah, get your online shopping done right. So. Um, I just wanted to say, um, saw some of you guys uh, all out at the Winston-Salem uh, Christmas Parade this past Saturday. A little bit chilly, uh, but it was a lot of fun. I think our community really needed that, actually. And it was done incredibly well um, and safely with the, the drive-thru. Uh, um, I uh, was the Grand Marshal um, stationed right next to Santa Claus very personally distant and uh, and we'll say that Santa Claus is doing everything he's supposed to do he is masked and he is personally distant and I saw him use hand sanitizer so no worries there um, a little bit about what's going on uh, across the country with COVID so case counts are coming down a little bit in the Midwest um, but uh, it's not saying a lot because they got a long ways to come down from if you look at the numbers uh, of cases per 100,000 people, they're still, uh, most counties are still up above 100 or close to it uh, in the Midwest, and the, uh, particularly the upper Midwest. Um, and hospitals are, uh, are really hurting up that way. Um, it, you can wait for two to three days sometimes in the emergency room before getting a hospital bed. So um, that is a harbinger of what could come here. Uh, in the in the triad here, our cases are continuing to increase. Those of you who are fans of the uh, state dashboard can check it out. Um, so here in Forsyth County, we're running at about 55 per 100,000. So if you're into the glass half full crowd, uh, that means we're about half of what the worst places are in the Midwest. But if you're in the half empty crowd, yeah, that's a lot of COVID. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's not just uh, the urban counties, it's also the rural counties. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the rural counties surrounding Winston-Salem and Forsyth County have rates that are actually uh, considerably higher than ours. Um, if you look at hospitalizations, <clears throat> we're, we're breaking new records for hospitalizations in, in the state, and the triad's no different um, pretty much every day. Um, the um, capacity um, of the hospitals is not to the point where we've had to pull alternate staffing or um, um, care plans, um, but I can tell you that things that are elective are being scaled back on, um, and that would might include some elective surgeries. There's other hospitals in North Carolina that are doing that. It's not because of safety problems or because of concerns that people might have uh, with getting an elective surgery such as a joint replacement now but you know if you could put something off two to three months you know if you've been dealing with your creaky knee for a year and a half waiting until March is not a big deal um, and that just uh, frees up some of our staff and our hospitals to take care of, uh, of patients uh, who have COVID or other medical emergencies. Um, so it's really not because we're worried about people getting COVID. It's just uh, to relieve the, uh, the strain of the number of people in the hospital. And I think you'll find that uh, pretty consistent over the next week or two uh, throughout the state. Other people will be doing that. Um, <clears throat> I ran some quick numbers yesterday. It was kind of interesting. <clears throat> Looking at hospitalizations here in Forsyth County, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here in Forsyth County, um, we um, and looking at where our patients being hospitalized in our area are coming from, and it turns out that um, a good number of them are actually coming from the rural counties from around us. And actually, if you look at the rural counties around us, some of the counties have hospitalization rates more than two times than what we're having in Guilford and Forsyth County. Why might that be? Um, well, one reason is, is I think there's less mask wearing in rural counties. And it turns out that the amount of virus that you get at the time you get COVID um, can influence how severe your COVID is going to be. So if you're wearing a mask at the time you get COVID, 
um, you get less virus, considerably less virus, and you don't get as sick. Now there's a reason to wear a mask, isn't it? So uh, the other reasons are is that some of the uh, rural counties around us access to medical care is a little tougher and the social economic uh, aspects um, uh, are a little different. So um, if you live in a rural area uh, in and around Forsyth County, you're not immune um, at all. And uh, the same things um, that we uh, talk about for everybody else um, apply. Um, personal distancing, avoiding crowds, including your own family and friends and social events and house events, um, washing your hands uh, and wearing the mask. So that's the big three, right? Um, if everybody did that, um, our rates will come down. But we need everybody. We need to be all in on that. It's really important. Um, those of us who work in hospitals uh, are really, really would like for you to do that um, because it's, um, it's getting a little tight and um, we want to make sure we're there, um, uh, in, you know, in two or three weeks. So as you probably heard, new restrictions here in North Carolina. Um, if you're outside of the state, you might already be dealing with some restrictions. Um, but we now are on a modified shelter at home which means that from 10 at night until 5 in the morning, you're, you're supposed to stay home. That is really easy for me because <laughs> I am not a night owl anymore um, and I need my beauty sleep. But um, um, I guess for some people it, it might be a thing. So bars are going to start stop selling alcohol. I believe it's 9 o'clock, I think it is. Um, there's going to be more scrutiny on eating establishments to make sure they're not going past. Um, this is a shot over the bow for us here in North Carolina um, because I, I know um, that um, if our cases keep going up and if we still have problems with, uh, with people really not following the three things, um, we're going to find ourselves in a full lockdown. And that's not what we want during the holiday season. In fact, we never want it. So let's just do it voluntarily. Um, a couple things to think about. One, <clears throat> holiday season workplace parties, not a good idea. Um, talking to my friends at the health department, um, we're, um, we, uh, we're, we're hearing a lot um, of exposures and having to do contact tracing around uh, holiday uh, get-togethers, um, including in the workplace. So I know my media friends here would not be doing that, um, but, and that includes, you know, the casual lunch, you know, let's say, let's just walk down the street and grab a bite to eat together. Eight people sitting around a table with your masks off is a good way to get COVID and we hear about that. Um, same thing with going out and having an after work drink. Um, not a good idea right now. Um, so just something to think about. Coming up on Christmas, uh, people want are thinking about traveling. Here's a few things to think about. One is a lot of the country right now, traveling there isn't going to be easy or fun, um, particularly California. Uh, mandatory 14-day quarantine if you come in. Hotel rooms are not available for tourism or visiting. They're only available for essential workers now. Um, so uh, more and more states are going to be doing that. So you're going to have to check on that. Um, remember that your family that's not living with you is another bubble. Bubble fusions are a time when COVID transmission occurs. Um, so it really probably, I think this year is a time to have a small intimate family Christmas. Um, and, um, and it can still be extremely special. Enjoy your own family, enjoy your kids, visit virtually. Um, good time of year to do that. Um, a message that I have uh, from the Forsyth County Health Department um, is that the case numbers are so high now um, and they get so far behind in contact tracing, they're not going to be contact tracing everyone. So that means that if you are a contact person, you may not get a phone call. Um, the people who are actually um, test positive are being asked to call their contacts themselves. 
if you get a call or if you think you've been exposed, um, one, get tested. Right around day five is a good time to do that. Two, quarantine yourself. Don't wait for somebody to call you and tell you to do it. Um, the quarantine time um, is, a, is a little bit less onerous now. Um, the, we have three options, 14 days if you're in a setting where you're around a lot of other people, such as a, a dorm room or a prison or something like that. Um, 10 days um, otherwise, and so most people can do a 10-day quarantine. Um, and if you have a reason that you really need to get back into life and uh, work or, um, you know, so people like firemen and stuff, we don't want all our firemen on quarantine, right? Not a good time to have a house fire. So those people will be quarantining for seven days, but testing them on day five uh, so that they can come back. So, um, so, that's, uh, so that's, not, that's not good when we can't follow up and do all our contact tracing. It's just uh, the health departments are just overwhelmed. People between the ages of 18 and 55 will be the priority for calling. Um, outside of congregate settings um, like nursing homes and stuff. We'll still do the high-risk areas. But, uh, and then 18 to 55 because those are the people who are out and about. So, um, saw something the, um, this morning in the paper about colleges um, kind of putting together all the data from the colleges in the U.S. and taking all the information and I and I know it's the same thing here um, uh, for the colleges that stayed open in North Carolina, um, that the cases they were having were more from off-campus transmission and from off-campus housing areas and not, not the college itself, not the classroom, not the lab, uh, not the, not the uh, study areas or libraries. So it was, uh, it was in, in the social situations. So. Um, that kind of gives us some information for moving forward for the spring semester. Um, there were several colleges here in North Carolina that did pretty well. Um, I had mentioned a few of them a couple weeks ago um, and then heard from a lot of people who had colleges that I didn't mention. So I will mention them now, uh, UNC Greensboro, uh, Wingate. Um, and if I didn't mention you specifically, from your college, don't feel left out. Um, just feel great that you got through the semester. Um, so, um, vaccine. Um, so, Christmas isn't the only thing, or Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa isn't the only thing just right around the corner. Vaccine's around the corner. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how far around the corner it is, but it's um, it's uh, close enough so that if you peek around the corner, you'll see it. Um, and um, next week, I think you'll be hearing about vaccination programs starting. We talked a lot about vaccine last week, so um, if you missed uh, that Facebook Live or you missed the media report, uh, you can find it in an archives from uh, uh, Way Forest Baptist Health media pages, um, and you can learn a lot, including frequently asked questions about vaccine. So we're going to be doing healthcare workers. Um, and nursing home residents and nursing home staff first. Um, and they will, um, they'll be, uh, we'd like to have all of them done, um, well, as soon as possible, but it looks like we could probably get it done uh, for nursing homes maybe by early part of January. Healthcare workers, realistically, it might be the latter part of January. And then at that time, there'll be more, more vaccine available and we'll start doing general population. We're going to concentrate on older people and people with underlying health problems first. Um, and, um, and then there'll be some segments of people who um, are critical to functioning, like teachers and things, things like that, fire workers. And, um, and then if you're otherwise healthy and young and you're um, not in a, in a critical aspect job, uh, you'll probably be a little bit towards later spring, early summer. Children are being studied right now. There's clinical trials going on in kids right now. And when those are done and the data is analyzed, uh, the kids will be able to be immunized. And we'd like to do that next summer, so before, before school starts. So that's a little bit on the prioritization in, in the big sense. There's a lot of 
small angles, but it's available on the state website, so you can get it from there and see it. I saw the data that Pfizer, which is the first vaccine that we'll have out, submitted to the FDA. Um, and I'm really encouraged, actually. Um, you heard the media reports earlier about it being 95% eff efficacy. It really is. And I did the numbers myself on my own computer. It really is 95% efficacy. I can tell you the numbers look things like this of seven people getting COVID in the, um, in the vaccine group versus almost 200 getting it in the placebo group. That's really significant. Over 37,000 people um, have been looked at now in the clinical trial. Um, we're still enrolling in clinical trials. Um, and uh, the vaccine's safe. No major problems with the vaccine. Um, you will, though, have a bit of a sore arm afterwards. Um, roughly about 30% or so um, will get a sore arm. Um, the duration of it lasts about um, a day and a half. So it's not, not the end of the world. And um, you know, ibuprofen, Motrin, Tylenol will help a lot with it. Um, depending on your age, somewhere about between, um, uh, I think it's eight to 15% might get a fever the day after the vaccine. That usually doesn't last more than 24 hours. And it also responds to Tylenol and Motrin. So we have other vaccines that are like that. Um, and I, in my travel clinic, um, give these a lot of times for rabies or uh, international travel and it's really unusual for people to, to lose work or sleep. You, maybe you won't do your tennis match that evening but, um, but it's not a major problem. So efficacy, safety, it's there. Um, and after I've looked at the data I can tell you I'm getting the vaccine um, and I, obviously I'm a healthcare worker. Um, and I will have no concerns or qualms about doing so. Um, so we'll have um, more vaccine coming out in January. Moderna's vaccine will be out then. And then as we get into later January, there'll be other candidates coming down the line too, and I won't go through the long list. As time goes on, more and more vaccine will be available. The more people that get immunized, the faster we get out of this. It's that simple. So. Um, will we be able to put down the masks um, and stop the social distancing next week? No, because it's going to take a considerable amount of time to get enough people immunized so that social distance isn't, isn't important. My prediction will still be doing masking and social distancing into the fall. Vaccine plus the social distancing are multiplicative, so the, the two of those together will work better than either of them by themselves. So, um, so it's to remember that uh, uh, when you're going out and about. So um, uh, we talked a little bit about the holidays. Um, and uh, so I think next week, um, if uh, people want to submit questions about holiday activities and uh, what things that, uh, that we might want to do. You can ask me what Dr. Hall will be doing for the holidays in a safe way and what I consider safe and what I don't consider safe and what my colleagues and friends who are also infectious disease doctors and epidemiologists. So um, go ahead and submit your questions over the next week and we'll talk about that next week. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to questions from the uh, group here. In the UK, the other reports came out that there were some some people that did have an allergic reaction to the vaccine, and uh, I was watching some of the media uh, medical experts uh, earlier this morning that were saying if you know if you have a history of allergic reactions, if you're a mother who's breastfeeding or pregnant, you, you may want to wait in terms of getting the vaccine. What can you explain? Yeah. So the question was about the allergic reactions, the two healthcare workers in the UK, and then also pregnancy and breastfeeding, two separate issues. So pregnancy and breastfeeding, we'll see what the ACIP says about that. Um, so the, the two vaccines that are out first are messenger RNA vaccines. Um, and there's not been a, long, a large number of pregnant women in that group. Um, so we'll see what the ACIP 
says. Um, there's two angles to look at. One is, is that if you're pregnant, um, the, you have a small but real chance, of, uh, higher chance of being hospitalized or having more serious COVID. I mean, it's not huge, but it's, it's enough. So that would be a reason to get the vaccine, right? Um, but then the other aspect is just that there's not as many people who've been studied with it. So um, I know that the uh, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine and then the uh, ACOG, which is the gynecologists and obstetricians, um, are really petitioning for trials for pregnant women so we can see that. I think it's going to be okay. I think it's, I mean, knowing how the vaccine's made and with our, um, um, with our um, experience with other vaccines, I think pregnancy will be fine. But, um, you know, some people would rather see the data first. Uh, they, so it's, because this vaccine's not a live vaccine, it's live vaccines that we don't give to pregnant women and this one's not live. So the second part of your question is the allergic reaction. So that, that we look at for all vaccines actually. And it's not allergies like I get a stuffy nose allergy or um, you know, I get a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a hive allergy. This is full-blown anaphylaxis, which is um, trouble breathing and, um, and blood pressure. Those people know they have that problem. <laughs> Um, and these, these are people who carry around EpiPens um, and, you know, they don't want a bee sting. Uh, they can't eat peanuts. Um, and they, they tend to be very um, allergic to lots of different things. Um, and those people, we kind of are very careful with vaccinating, even with the vaccines we've been using for 50 years. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons we watch people after vaccination. Uh, in clinics, which we're going to do with the COVID vaccine too. So if you have a history of having multiple severe allergic events to multiple different things and, uh, and you have to carry around an EpiPen and you have had anaphylaxis after things before, that would be a reason to tell the people in the vaccine clinic. Um, but I, I, it's really not a serious problem. Those, those numbers of people are extremely small. Yeah. Good question though. There are some folks out there who, for various reasons, are, are dead set against getting this vaccine. I was wondering if you could, again, talk about the, the safety and just give your pitch, your sales pitch, on why people need to get it. Yeah, well, well, the sales pitch for getting the vaccine is an easy one. It's our ticket out of this. Um, and I think everyone's sick of having COVID around. Um, and, you know, the amount of, of impact on our lives and not even just you know people who are who are dying, which is happening, and people who are in the hospital, which is, I mean, no one wants to be hospitalized for this, and um, the number of people who have to quarantine, the number of things that you can't do normally, um, between schools and work and what have you, our economy is going to be tanking. This is our way out of this. And, and um, you know, we, we look at the trials. We didn't rush the vaccine as far as the clinical trials go. It was done the exact same way. We just made them big and enrolled people um, and got them in and, uh, and spent the time and money to make sure it was done quickly and safely. Um, and quick doesn't mean unsafe. It just, so the data is the data. Um, and uh, the vaccine is efficacious and it's safe. So um, it not only will it, w can you protect yourself um, and your family members, but, um, but you can help get us out of this quicker if you get vaccinated. And, and there are going to be some people who they say, OK, well, I'm pregnant. Maybe I'll wait. So what you do is you cocoon around that. Husband gets vaccinated. Um, you know, and then uh, maybe the college kid who comes home, you know, uh, once a month gets vaccinated. Kids are going to have to wait a little bit on, but as soon as they're not, they're not giving it to their parents anyway. It's the parents who are giving it to the kids. So you cocoon off the, the, uh, the vulnerable person. What, uh, what percentage of the population needs to get it for this to be effective? What's the goal of the medical community as far as, you know? Yeah. How many so how many people need to get it? So it's kind of like, uh, 
<laughs> just to put it in simple terms, um, it's kind of like a mud run. If you've ever done a mud run, you know, where you put on the high boots and you slog through the mud. Um, if you're the virus slogging through the mud, the more people who get vaccinated, the thicker and deeper the mud is for that, for that virus to get transmitted. Um, so the more, as we get more and more people vaccinated, what we call the R naught, which is the transmission number that we use, is going to start going down. Once it goes down and gets down around one, then we have less and less and less cases of COVID every day. What's that number going to be? It's, it's a little hard to know. If we continue to mask and personally distance, we don't have to have quite as many people immunized. Uh, but we'd like to have at least uh, you know, half the population done by mid-September. Um, and if we do that, I think we're going to have a lot better um, summer season and fall. And Christmas next year could even seem normal. I want to follow up with your sales pitch. You know, historically, there is this, a distrust between the African-American population and the medical community. And there's also a reluctance to get this vaccine from them, but also from the Hispanic community, or recent polls and studies have found. What partnerships is a medical, is Wake Forest Baptist Health doing in the community to remove those obstacles or to try and, and reach those groups that are? Yeah, so, um, yeah, um, communities of color um, and, um, and Hispanic communities um, have, have traditionally been more reluctant for medical therapies of all kind. Um, not just vaccines. So, um, you know, it's, um, it's a matter of, um, of forming a, a trust relationship with, you know, our, pa our patients and with our people. Um, you know, you can, you can educate a lot. Education by itself is not enough. And so it's really reaching out into these communities. Um, the health department's gonna be working hard on this. Uh, as will I, um, and I mean, and everyone. You know, I think it kind of comes down to the individual healthcare provider talking individually to the patients, because there's already a lot of times sort of a trust relationship that's already been built up there, and and talking about those individual points. Um, and but yeah, it's a it's a formidable problem, and uh, um, and yeah, we're going to do everything we can to help these communities because as you know these communities actually have higher rates of uh, of covid and hospitalization and death so it's we we want to reach out there the, the trials included a lot of people um who were um uh, so they were ethnically diverse and racially diverse as well so we know the vaccine was just as efficacious and just as safe in those populations so a lot of it's just getting the word out on that to the people in this vaccine, I know a, a recent article was uh, released in High Point just talking about the strain that is being put on uh, Wake Forest Baptist Medical, uh, Medical Center in, in High Point here in Winston State. We're talking about the ICU beds uh, just being full up. What will this vaccine be able to do to alleviate a lot of the stress that the medical centers? Yeah, so I mean, just a, a clarification the question was about, you know, the medical centers being stressed. Um, you know, our ICU capacity hasn't been tanked. Um, we're, still, we're still okay there. Um, compared to last spring when ICU beds were filling up faster, um, we're, we found some ways to keep people out of the ICU this time. So, so far, so good. Um, um, you know, a little bit finger crossed and a little salt over the shoulder, but, but so far, so good on that. Um, so how will a vaccine help us in healthcare? Well, two ways. One, when we get healthcare workers vaccinated, we won't have to have as many quarantined healthcare workers because right now, um, healthcare workers are a member of our community, right? So they're part of the community at large. And so if they have an exposure at home uh, from their spouse or from their high, um, college kid, or for crazy Uncle Eddie who came to visit for way too long, um, then they get exposed and then they have to quarantine. Um, or, or, um, and so 
that reduces our staffing. Um, the other thing is, is as the number of cases start to come down in other areas across the country as well, it frees up our staffing because a lot of our nurses and doctors are locum tenens, which means they're travelers. They, they go from hot spot to hot spot. And then, uh, and lastly, as we have fewer cases admitted to our hospitals, things, you know, get lightened up. So it's, uh, it's to help us um, in our staffing, and it's also to help reduce the number of cases that are hospitalized. And, and doing the nursing homes first, while that might seem like a minor segment of the population, these are the people who get hospitalized, and, and you know, half of our deaths are in people over the age of 75. So if we can get, get that group immunized, that'll take uh, a, a quite a bit of strain. Um, so I'm hoping by the time the daffodils and the, are coming up and the, and the cherry trees are blooming that um, we'll get a little bit of breathing room in the hospitals and also in the community. But we gotta get vaccinated. We gotta wear our masks. And, and Wake Forest by ourselves, you all have a drone system. Uh, what role will that be able to play in helping get these vaccines out to some of the, some of the campuses? You know, the, so the question is, is about our drone system and vaccines. I don't think we've talked about delivering vaccines by drone mm -hmm. um, because most of the places we would be delivering them to, we can kind of just put them in the car in a big cooler. Um, they, they, the vaccine has to be kept really cold. And so we, we keep it in, you know, minus 80 freezers that are here in Winston. And then if the vaccine event is out in Wilkes or if it's, you know, somewhere else, we deliver it there that day, and which is fine. I don't know if a drone can carry a big igloo freezer. Uh, I'd have to check with the drone guys on that one. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. I'd always envisioned it going the usual way. <laughs> well, and, and, and to I know, uh, again, just some of the, the, the national medical experts are talking about how, you know, we'll, we'll get vaccines, but we're only going to use a small portion at a time. Is, why is that? Well, a small portion at a time, it's simply because the factories are, it's taking them a while to ramp up and make enough. Um, and so the amount we get initially is, uh, is going to be smaller. And as more companies come on board and as the factories get their production ramped up, there's more and more and more of it's available. It's, it's no different than a PlayStation 5, right? So. We had some questions over here. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you're talking about as far as logistics of once we receive the vaccine, how we're going to distribute it. But what's the first step someone needs to take? Do you register online? How? Yeah, so, well, for our healthcare workers, we're handling all that internally, and, um, and different healthcare systems are doing that differently. Most of it's going to be by appointment because there's paperwork to fill out um, beforehand. Um, so, what will end up happening, um, I think, um, and some of these details are still to be worked out because people at large won't be vaccinated until January or late January. Um, so it'll come from the uh, from your physicians and from where you seek health care that yeah, when you're eligible um, for vaccination or the call will be put out or it'll be put out through the media so for the people who are going to get it at the health department um, and then um, and then I think a lot of it will be by appointment still um, and then you fill out the stuff online that is uh, kind of like a consent form, just like you would for a shot to go to Kenya, you know, for, and then, um, and, then, um, and then you can download an app on your phone, which is a way of reporting any reactions or feelings that you might have about the vaccine, so we can follow that. Um, and then the app uh, will remind you when to come back for the second dose of the vaccine, because a lot of these uh, a lot of the vaccines we'll be using are a two-dose series. The first one to get things going and the second one is a boost for immunity. Um, and, um, and so that, that's kind of how it'll work. There'll be mass vaccination events as well, um, you know, such as, you know, at the you know, at a Coliseum or football stadium or gymnasium or things like that. Um, and, um, and so there'll be a lot of different ways people can get it.
but it'll be Jan January time frame for, for most of the, the, the higher risk population. We're seeing a lot of schools going back to remote learning. And I believe I read where you said, you know, you're in favor of keeping the kids in school. I was wondering if you still feel that way, what your thoughts are on. Yeah, so keeping kids in school, um, and do I still feel that way? Yes, I, I still think you can. It, it comes down to the logistics is what it does because you can educate kids safely in school uh, um, and we know how to do that now. Enough places have done it and, and the data is really clear that schools are not the engine of transmission of COVID in our communities. Um, and, um, and it's basically the, 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 the logistics of, of masking and keeping the kids apart and paying attention to detail around times of eating and things like that. Um, so if the school system can, can do all those things that they need to do and engage the parents so that the parents are partners in this and not sending kids who are sick to school, the schools can be safe, safely open. Um, but you know, not, all, not all the school systems have resources to do that. And then also as more and more COVID's in the community, um, you're going to have more people out because they're either have COVID themselves or they are in quarantine. So if you know a third of your teachers are in quarantine, it's kind of hard to continue to have in class. But So it, it depends on, on the school and the situation, but absolutely it can be done safely, yeah. How much longer do you think it's gonna be uh, from you know, big medical centers getting the vaccine to where people can just go to you know, CVS or Walgreens to get, to get the vaccine? I went there yesterday and they already got a sign saying we don't have Yeah, I know they're getting Yeah, so when will you be able to get it at CVS or Walgreen? I, I'm thinking probably sometime towards the end of January. There's a national prioritization where what we're being told to do from the CDC and the federal government through the state governments. And um, and once they um, once they, you know, pull the trigger on it for their general population then CVS's and Walgreens will have it. So it turns out that in the interim, until that happens, um, CVS and Walgreens actually have contracted and partnered with a lot of our nursing homes to do the nursing home staff and our elderly. So, so they won't be just sitting on their laurels. They got people to vaccinate. But. Any other questions? All right, so submit questions for next week about, um, about holidays and holiday safety with COVID. Um, and uh, we'll see you then.